as um, Alex said, today there's a lot of disenchantment among conservatives with the free economy. And there are several reasons why we really shouldn't be surprised about that. The first reason, I'm afraid, is that, as the book of Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. Bad ideas never really go away. They come back uttered by different people with different reasoning, but they remain bad ideas all the same. They represent persisting intellectual temptations, and each generation yields to them. I can remember myself all sorts of versions of conservatism. The British Conservative Party has been as fertile in reinvention via slogans as it has been sterile in rethinking its policy failures. Most of these reinventions had one thing in common. They drifted to the left on economics, which the politicians didn't really want to think about much anyway. And this is what, for a time, Margaret Thatcher changed. The second reason is that after the West won the Cold War on the platform of freedom, it quickly forgot or found it disagreed about what freedom is. And that was the theme, of course, of our first panel. Part of freedom, though not the only part, I would certainly agree, is that combination of private property, free exchange, competition, limited government and a rule of law, which together constitute the system of economic liberty. The third reason for this disenchantment is that today the rich global elite, the new masters of the world and at least the masters of capitalism, are by and large determined enemies of conservatism in all forms. And it's perfectly natural and in some respects perfectly justified to teach them a lesson and knock them off their perches. The fourth reason is that struggles for possession of and access to resources have in many cases gone beyond the level of economics and must be considered matters of strategic security. Now this is a slippery argument, but there is something in it. We should take it seriously, particularly as regards China, and uh, Alex touched on that. Finally, and this is the only reason with which, in my view, uh, we should have total sympathy, is that economics is not the be-all and end-all of a good state policy. There may be choices that a nation makes that involve its sacrificing certain economic gains for some greater good. As conservatives, we should have no objection to that. We should, though, insist that everyone is clear what it involves and that no one gets away with suggesting that you can pursue some interventionist course without paying a price, often a high price. More recently, there have been two trends which may at first sight appear disconnected but aren't really. The first is the abandonment by governments of all political colours, including the Conservatives in Britain, of course, of the successful formulae of the 1980s when socialism was discredited and communism was defeated. And this is partly the result of a lack of principled leadership on the right of centre, which has led to the upsurge of a more radical right. This lack of principle allowed collectivist analysis and solutions to become the norm. The 2008-2009 financial crisis, for example, was used to discredit private finance, even though it was actually underpinned by irresponsible government policy. The COVID crisis was used to expand the reach and authority of the state with little or no criticism. Combined with years of irresponsibly low interest rates, the vast state expenditure involved now threatens the whole system. Climate change alarmism, which again, despite the flimsy science, has been taken up by mainstream conservatives without question, uh, on top of all that, has restricted the scope for economic growth, and growth alone can get us out of the red. Well, the other trend, which began, I think, in America, but which uh, I am told is now doing the rounds of conservative intellectuals in Europe, and indeed is viewed benignly, I am also told, in Budapest, is that the free economy is a problem because liberalism is a problem, indeed the problem. 
and the conservatives should concentrate on culture wars and state power to fight the liberal menace. Now, that's a caricature, of course, but not, I think, entirely an unfair one. Earlier conservative successes are nowadays in these circles treated as if they were irrelevant or even harmful because the alliance with liberals against socialism during the Cold War was, it is argued, counterproductive for real conservative ends. Now, the most authoritative and stimulating essay on such matters is Yoram Hazoni's Conservatism, a Rediscovery. We should read it. Uh, I have, you should. I am all for what is called, in this trend, national conservatism, as interpreted by some of its enthusiasts. But there's a wide disagreement about between these enthusiasts, at least in Britain, uh, about the free market. And indeed, it's the economic side of this national conservatism that concerns me now. So very briefly, liberalism is certainly a distinct philosophy, and it comes in different shapes and sizes, some of which now, as in the past, shade into leftism. The Americans have called what we Europeans call socialists, they have called them liberals uh, ever since the Second World War, rather misleadingly. In any case, the real world, I would argue, is not a world of isms. Isms are what you derive from reality. Liberalism, in British terms anyway, isn't so much a corpus of writings by Locke, Mill and others. It's a convenient shorthand for arrangements and institutions which emerged, in the British case and the, and the Anglo-Saxon case, from great constitutional and political conflicts between the 17th and 19th centuries. Edmund Burke, for example, is apparently, for some people, now the prophet of national conservatism. But the historical Burke, the real Burke, as opposed to this reinvented Burke, is a Whig, that is an old-fashioned liberal. And he was indeed an extreme economic liberal. Adam Smith remarked that he'd never found anyone who agreed with him more wholeheartedly than Burke. Limited government, private property, a rule of law, understood both as common law, that's customary law, and in the Hayekian sense as common rules for all, independent courts, freedom of speech, parliamentary popular government, which only after a very long period became majoritarian democracy, and a free enterprise economy, this, I would argue, is the flesh of Western liberalism. I wouldn't say it's the soul, but at least it's the tangible body. The Western tradition offers much more than all this, and the conservative tradition in particular stresses, for example, the role of religion. But these free institutions and a free market are a central part of the Western historical legacy. Why specifically do conservatives and liberals, in the old-fashioned sense of classical liberals, uh, I would say real liberals, why do conservatives and liberals see things the same way so often in history. Well, conservatives have a stronger sense of what constitutes human nature, what Alex um, was referring to, I think, in The Fall, at least the black side of human nature, the dark side, but not say black because you know, we get into trouble, the dark side of human nature. Conservatives have a stronger sense of what constitutes human nature and its importance in shaping institutions and determining events than do liberals. Liberals are often immoderately optimistic. Conservatives indeed remember the fall and liberals really think it never happened. But both conservatives and liberals agree uh, at the most elementary level about the importance of the individual. Conservatives, unlike liberals, see individuals as being formed by and capable of understanding self-understanding through, not despite, through institutions and traditions. And this is implicit in Burke and the most important theme pursued by the late and much lamented Sir Roger Scruton. But both liberals and conservatives agree or should agree about the unique value and ultimate worth of the individual human person. 
Conservatives and liberals are therefore very interested in liberty, although the aspects will differ. Today, many conservatives stress the importance of the common good uh, above liberty. But in practice, conservatives cannot accept that any system is legitimate that denies freedom of worship, freedom to educate your children as you wish, and freedom of conscience. Of course, some self-styled liberals now do deny these things, but they are then untrue to their own tradition. Conservatives, like liberals, dislike and distrust concentrations of power because they, we, understand uh, even more than do liberals how often power, particularly state power, but not only state power, is misused. Conservatives, like liberals, uh, understand the limits of state planning because they are profoundly skeptical on epistemological grounds, that's on grounds of what you can know, about the possibility of a single all-knowing and all-powerful authority having the information to get things right. And indeed, I note that though Hayek has fallen out of favor, uh, at least partly, partially with some of these new national conservatives, you won't find this better expressed anywhere than in Hayek. But Hayek's arguments, though as we've heard he refused to call himself a uh, conservative, are indeed fundamental conservative arguments. Now, there were therefore, I would argue, good reasons of principle and not just of convenience why conservatives and libertarians, to use another problematic term, got together from 1950s, the 1950s on in America, we've heard about Bill Buckley uh, and others, and in Britain to defeat the left. But it also made political sense, and we shouldn't forget this. And these reasons, I would argue, mutatis mutandis apply today. You see, the problem really isn't too complicated. Everyone from Edmund Burke on has recognized it. Burke thought that the franchise should properly be restricted to men of property, and I do mean men of property. Uh, and he thought that about 400,000 people in a population of about uh, 7 million to 8 million in Britain could rightly be considered as entitled to constituting public opinion. Well, in a democracy, everybody has the vote. And the fact is that there are not enough conservatives, even when you try, as Donald Trump and Boris Johnson have tried to varying degrees, to rope in public sector and industrial working class voters, there's not enough conservatives. Uh, and you can't find a majority for sensible conservative policies. Now, a sensible conservative policy involves all the things we've mentioned, plus light regulation and low taxes, so that the country is stable and so it can get richer. Now, conservative governments must create the conditions for people to improve their own and their families' living standards, and that means economic growth. Year after year, many cultural conservatives might like a static society or a static economy. But if they try to produce either, they will lose elections and the politically uncommitted will accept the dogmas of the left. Economic change is disruptive. At some periods, highly disruptive. But Joseph Schumpeter's wonderful metaphor of the gales of creative destruction isn't, isn't how it usually works. In a free economy, changes do not come by coercion. They come through the operation of the infinitely complex price mechanism, and usually in a manner and at a rate to which most, if not all, people can adapt. And it's when the government, by intervening through subsidies, tariffs, monopolies, or whatever, tries to block change entirely and fails, that the outcome is, tra is traumatic, as it was, for example, with the uh, government subsidized, protected, militantly unionized coal mining industry in Britain that I had to deal with from the Home Office perspective in the 1980s. But having said all of that, I would just repeat, there is no reason to pursue a pure free market policy in every case at every period. It's just that whenever you deviate, you run into problems. And then there's the question, of course, of free trade. Well, there is never completely free trade. There is always managed trade. But the freer it is, the better people are uh, materially. 
Uh, and the economic advances of the world under successive GATT agreements, free trade agreements, lowering tariffs, is clear on this. Uh, and what changed the uh, prospects, the economic prospects of people living in Africa and Asia, particularly uh, India, was the end of this socialist idea put forward by the World Bank. We should remember in the 1960s that these economies should be self-sufficient and practice what was called import substitution. That policy kept third world countries living with third world living standards. Chile is another example. We've heard a lot about it. We're going to hear more. But I would just take this trade example. Um, living for decades behind tariff walls and concentrating on the production and export of a single monopoly. First of all, it was nitrates, and then it was copper. And Chile stayed more or less in the third world. But when under the military government and with the advice of the Chicago boys, it cut these tariffs and opened up its economy, all right, there was a huge shock because, of course, this uh, 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 collectivist position had been that for many, many decades. It quickly attracted investment, benefited from diversification, and grew. Well, here in Croatia, we uh, hear lots about the shortcomings of the free economy. We hear that the country is too reliant on tourism. We hear that there should be more investment going instead into industry. We hear about the collapse of agriculture and the resultant, and this is real, depopulation of Slavonia. Well, you won't actually deal with these policies anyway. You can't within the European Union by trade measures. You would have to deal with them uh, by subsidies and uh, intervention uh, internally uh, of some kind or another. And uh, we will be uh, talking about the implications, I think, of some of that in this very important and I think will be very interesting panel on demography on Friday. But we, what we should not forget is that uh, well, two things, really. One is that when you intervene in order to maintain your agriculture, maintain this area, maintain that area, don't pretend that you are, as a result of that, going to increase the overall wealth of the country. You are imposing costs. These are not national benefits. They may have compensating advantages, which you wish to take. It's your right. It's your country to take it. But they are costs. The other thing I think which has to be said, and we have not been clear enough uh, among conservatives really on this, and, what, and particularly mainstream conservatives, if they can still be called conservatives, anyway, right of center people, um, uh, are not at all clear about it now. And it's this. It is that it is perfectly compatible with a strict, and it's perfectly compatible to have a free enterprise economy and have a strict and selective control of immigration, both of temporary workers and, of course, of permanent migrants. And the idea, which seems to have grown up and which uh, the Prime Minister in Britain does not seem to understand the implications of, but he will when he loses the next election, uh, the idea that the sovereign powers of the state to decide who will and will not reside in the country should simply be abandoned because of economic policy or some other agreement is the single biggest reason why uh, right-wing conservative and popular commitment to free enterprise itself has been lost. There are other reasons, good reasons, to intervene in the economy. Um, uh, we energy security, for example, but let's just look at energy security. Um, obviously, it's a complex issue, but at one level, it isn't a complex issue, actually. Um, it is too big an issue simply to be left to the market. But, but, today's energy crisis was made by politicians, not markets. It was made immediately by the war in Ukraine. It was made by Germany during the chancellorship of the greatly overpraised Mrs. Merkel, which in a panic got rid of all of its nuclear power facilities and accelerated its dependence on Russia. It was made and is made by the suicidal determination of Western leaders to sign up 
to programs designed to achieve carbon net zero. So there are indeed questions about what you can leave to markets and what you can't. But it very frequently turns out under cooler and closer analysis that our problems with markets are usually our problems with governments. And we elect governments, so ultimately it's our, prob our problem is ourselves. We're not realistic about our expectations. We expect more from government than government can possibly do. Uh, we expect somehow that people who run government are going to be better than we are, when we should assume they're going to be worse than we are, because that's why they go into politics. There are notable exceptions, but I've met lots of politicians and most of them do not go in in order to uh, uh, achieve a quick uh, uh, route to heaven. They go in for other reasons. Now, the idea that you actually want to put all of these great problems into the hands of politicians, particularly centralized government, and say, please solve it. Please solve it. If you do that, you deserve what you get. The market is us. It's for us to use our freedom responsibly. And conservative values, which have nothing much to do with the market, will help us to use our freedom responsibly. Thank you.